Oh, what a mess. This is Neil Schneider. Welcome back to My Messy Basement. This week, we're releasing Vero Perception 4.0. For those unfamiliar, Vero Perception is software that lets you take existing games that were never designed for virtual reality and play them in their full VR glory. Now, it's not quite native, not quite native, but we're pretty darned close. And I think, I think everyone who sees this and experiences it is going to be very, very excited. More than this, the software is completely free. Okay, there's no charges, no subscription fees. It, it's completely free. And, uh, you know, what's even more amazing is the software is put together by volunteers. More amazing than that? Well, nothing much more amazing than volunteers. But actually, actually, we have some big breakthroughs to share with you today. And there's a couple surprises as well. So I think everyone who watches this is going to be extremely, extremely thrilled. I, I just, you know, look, I'm just going to say it. I think with, in the case of Vero Perception, we're really setting the bar much higher for what Vero Perception is expected to deliver and what a virtual reality driver is capable of delivering. And I, I think we're going to set some trends. I really do. Now, in today's interview, we have none other than Dennis Reichel. He's one of the core developers up behind Vario Perception. Also on the list, I, I mean, they're not being interviewed, but of course, they were of critical importance to making this software possible. They continue to be Simon, Gra excuse me, Simon Brown and Grant Bagwell. And of course, there's a whole list of developers, you know, that got us to this point as well. Um, so what, what can I say? Here we go. Let's let's just get into it with our interview with Dennis Reichel from the Vero Perception development team. This is Neil Schneider from Meant to Be Seen. Welcome to my messy basement. Uh, to my immediate left is none other than Dennis Reichel. Dennis is one of the core developers of Vero Perception. And unless you've been living under a rock, Vero Perception are those free open source drivers that let you take existing games and play them in virtual reality. Very exciting stuff. We're very proud to have been part of this project since its very beginning. Dennis, thank you so much for joining us. I am personally really excited about this because with the developers of Vario, we always talk to each other in Skype, but we don't actually talk to each other like with audio and video. So this is the first time I'm meeting you, Dennis. Yeah. So, so thanks so much for joining us. Dennis, t tell us a little bit about yourself. I mean, you've got this, this wonderful software background. You're easily one of the most creative developers I've met over the years. H you. How did you learn you know, to code? I coded since I'm, um, I'm about 12, I think, uh, on my C64, uh, the first time in basic, and, and, and I never stopped it. And, uh, with about 20, I, I started the first DirectX version, and, and C++ and yes. Well, yes. amazing work because, you know, similar to the other developers with Vero, you're so inventive. Like, you come up with all kinds of ideas and technologies that pe people haven't even considered. And it just <laughs> it just goes to show in Vero, we're so proud to have you, you know, in, in, involved with the, the, the project. So, why don't we talk a little bit about Vero, okay? I mean, it, it has, of course, changed architecture time and time again. It's years now that this project <laughs> has been in action. First up, why did you get involved with Vario? Ah, I got my first uh, uh, Oculus Dev Kit 1 in 2013 and then, yeah, any one of us wanted to play Skyrim in VR and, and Andres did uh, put uh, Vario on open source and then I watched the code and tried it and, and first I did code an own plugin for Skyrim uh, uh, to inject it with it as a DLL into the game and it worked fine and then I read your uh, you did put some some, some message uh, we really need more help and, and then I contacted you yeah so so just for those unfamiliar uh, Vero perception is open source so the idea is that we invite other developers to participate and everyone, of course, has their own spin and their own ideas, and then the Vario, of course, is the result of that. Um, but really, only a handful of developers are, you know, do this long term. So Dennis is one of those long term developers that, that's you know, really pioneered this space. So, you know, Dennis, 
what what sets it very apart? Like, what kinds of things have you been doing with with Vero perception up until today that really is unique compared to what we've seen before? Oh, um, I overtook the project when uh, stereo rendering was added by Chris Rain, and and uh, this that was also a new architecture then, and and. It wasn't working, especially not for Skyrim, our most favorite game uh, that we wanted to play. So the first thing I did was fixing Skyrim to work. Uh, and then, then we added the Presser menu and we added what was very important, uh, VR Boost. Uh, VR Boost uh, is our you know, a, a, a solution for, for head tracking especially, but also for field of view overriding it. And, and, and then, then was version 2.0 out. And, and yes, and then uh, after version 2.1, uh, we more and more thought about DirectX 11 and other devices, new devices to add, and this and that. And, and since Vri was a hard coded driver, you couldn't uh, uh, include that all in, in a hard coded driver that would have ended in a disaster, I think. Uh, so we I started to code a new architecture especially for DirectX 11, but also uh, that is more versatile and now acts with plugins for all uh, different trackers or whatever. So we're going to talk about all that stuff. Um, so for, for, by the way, is that your assistant coder next to you? So yes, assistant. yes. <laughs> <laughs> I have an assistant coder too, and she makes appearances every so often. Um, so let's talk a little bit about very like at a fundamental level, okay, at a basic level, for, mm -hmm. because it, it sounds crazy, you know, that we could take an existing game and and make it, you know, work in virtual reality. I mean, granted, I'm sure it's not as quite as good as native, but yeah. but still, it is impressive. Can you talk at a basic level? How does the software work? How does it do what it does? How does it do what it does? Uh, basically, uh, I would say uh, Vireo is, is an emulator. We, we call it a driver since it was always called a driver, but in case it is an emulator, so it does the same that any other emulator does. Uh, in case what we do, we inject by proxy DLL or by directly by DLL, and, and then first we uh, create a second render target, uh, then we Render to this second render target, and then we modify the matrices responsible for uh, uh, the pro projection on the screen. Okay. For two sides. So, so for for those unfamiliar, and I, just if I could re paraphrase a little bit, um, we really want to get a stereoscopic 3D result. I mean, that's really the core, I think, of the software, right? So you've got you want a left and right perspective. But the game was only designed for one. <laughs> it was only designed that's, to be a single that's, thing. That's the problem. So the so it, and and actually this technique has been used a long time, well before Virial, when in the three D days, where we you know where we take we use DirectX API calls. So we take this this call it a language being passed between the computer and the graphics card, and we capture mm -hmm. those call, calls, and yeah. we create a second camera view where a camera view didn't exist before. So exactly. is that, that, that about right? So the, um, and that's great work. And what we have to do, I take it, is while this is happening, you described having to modify the matrix. Maybe you can elaborate exactly what you mean by that in, in layman's terms. Okay. Um, basically, any 3D operation is done uh, mathematically uh, using so-called mat matrices. Uh, they do, they compute the different angels uh, X, Y, Z to, to the, be displayed uh, on the screen. I hope I... Yeah, yeah, and we have to right? and we have to modify that, right? Exactly, yeah. We, that means we have to uh, treat... Um, or, yeah, simply change the pro projection matrix uh, to, to uh, fit both uh, left and right image. image. It, it, it's actually a lot harder than it sounds. Cause, <laughs> but but it, you, I, it's very, in many ways, it makes it look easy, but it's, it's not so easy. It's a lot of work to, to, to make that happen, I take it. Actually, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Especially for the uh, direct it's 11. Uh, uh, 11 is much, much more, uh, has much more uh, stages 
until the, the image is rendered and we have to care about all those render stages uh, from from the vertex shader starting and ending at the pixel shader. Yeah. Now, now, if we could rewind a bit, um, I love this story. One of the flagship games, and really it is one of the games that shows very well at its best, is Skyrim. And I, I was hoping you could share the story of the nasty chicken in Skyrim and how <laughs> one chicken was a huge frustration for you. <laughs> yeah, when we were fixing the shadows for Skyrim, we never fully fixed them, but we will eventually with some, someone. Uh, we had to, I had to simply go around in, in Skyrim and, and look for objects that uh, had not the right shadows. So uh, there was a chicken in, and, and to, to watch the shadow, you, you need uh, uh, this shouldn't move, but this chicken always moves, so that drives me crazy. And so that's why this got, that got a, a scary chicken. You know? We were, we were up, like Dennis and I, we were emailing and Skyping and Skyping, trying to get Skyrim to work. And it, it was like, he's six hours ahead of me, right? So, so I'm in Eastern and he's uh, you're in Europe. So um, we were up at like three in the morning because of this yeah, freaking chicken. I remember that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it was such a it was such a victory to clear the shadow for for this friggin' chicken, but also Skyrim marked the beginning of VR Boost, and maybe you could talk a bit about VR Boost as to what it is and why why it's so important. Yeah, um, why it is so so important since if you do uh, a head tracking by mouse emulation or, or whatever or emulating the the gamepad or whatever, this is this is slower. So we we. This has latency, and, and, and so you get sick out of it, uh, from that. And so, so the first idea when I programmed my first uh, uh, DLL for for Skyrim was simply to yeah to change the memory directly. So I used a tool called Cheat Engine, uh, a cheaters tool to to find the correct angels in in memory, and then it worked. And then I included that in in uh, Viria. And it was actually your idea to call it via boost, real boost. <laughs> so yeah, and, and and we do, and that's the one element within the driver that we purposely keep locked down. It's all free, but we because you say you're you were using cheat engine and we're manipulating things, and we want it to be ethical, right? But uh, <laughs> yes. and we want to make sure that the works used appropriately. So, but but it's not just about. So really, what we're doing is we're we're manipulating the actual game architecture to do the work for us, yes? Exactly, yeah. yeah. So so what other what other things can we do with this VR boost? I mean so we've got we've got the head tracking. I mean what what other things have you been able to do uh, because of this technology? Yeah, this was also your idea, I remember, to to override the field of view setting from not any not every game has a field of view option or or at least a, some some have just a limited. But we need more field of view for for HMDs. So so th th that was the next thing. And what we now can do uh, is having positional tracking done by VR Boost, and that uh, has uh, is is simply much much better. Also, like this uh, any tracking done by by VR Boost is, is is better than in doing it in another way, since the game actually thinks that you move to the left or move to the right, and and yeah. Well, we'll talk about that because it's a, actually it's a really, I'm proud to say, it's a really big deal. Um, so, okay, so we've been working with DirectX 9 previously. We kind of mm -hmm. touched on DX10 for a while, but I don't think we really did much with it. Uh, no. you, you didn't really do much with it. Um, DirectX 11, okay? It, everyone's been waiting. We've been promising DX11 forever. <laughs> <laughs> and, I mean... These poor gamers. I mean, we show pictures of Bioshock, and and it's like, <laughs> okay, when's it happening? When's it happening? Yeah. Anyway, I, I think I've got kids now since since we started talking about this. But anyway, um, what you know, why is DX11 so hard? Like, what you know, what makes that architecture unique compared to DX9? As I mentioned before, we have all those different shaders. Starting with the vertex shader, the geometry shader, the tessellation shaders, uh, the compute shader. I didn't even think that we had to include that, and and also eventually the, the pixel shader. Uh, we had to care 
een pad on is. En ik, en ik buffer gewoon. En ik buffer, it's just a constant buffer to this shader, that shader, that shader. We have to care about this and then we have performance issues. Mighty threading comes with DirectX 11 also. That means the device can be, uh, must be, uh, or should, can be uh, multi threaded, uh, uh, and, and that all we had not in DirectX 9. And we had to care about this, and especially about the performance also. And that was why it is took so long. Yeah. We are, you know, we are really lucky because do you remember when you first shared, like it was a video, we're talking about performance and optimizing, and we were really concerned because the first time you did this, when we were rendering with Vero Perception, it was like a 30% of the 2D performance. Do you remember that? Like it was, yeah. and you were like, okay, well this is, we're stuck with it. And then, but, but fortunately something else happened. Maybe you could, you could release, you know, so that the gamers can relax. What kind of performance are we getting out of it? Oh, about 60%, I think, 60%. We have a video on one that shows that we lose about 30 uh, 35, 35%. That's actually, um, I, I, would, I, was, I, would, I thought it would be more, but that's actually really good because you're rendering yeah. to a left right view and you're only losing between 30 40% on the render. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, the bigger prob problem with, with performance now is with open, open world games. Open world games always, always uh, recreate the, or load new things when you walk, walk around, so you get. Uh, in open world games, some 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 lag uh, when you enter a new place or, or or just just walk around since the game loads. We we will see how to fix that. This is uh, absolutely fixable by maybe by co uh, installing the game on an S SSD or or so. But eventually, the the, the frame rate is fine. Yeah. So let's talk about. The flagship game for this DirectX 11. I mean, what was the perfect game to make this thing work? The perfect game for us was last year when Bethesda announced Fallout 4. We definitely knew that we want that game to play in virtual reality, and that was why we fully concentrated on that game. And it was much work, and I want to dedicate this work to Todd and and and. and uh, uh, the whole Bethesda team, uh, I really love, like their games and, and yeah, we, anyone out there wants to play that game in, in virtual reality and we know that since anyone wants, wants to play Skyrim and that was why we fully, fully concentrated on that game. So, so the, uh, I mean, what kind of, so we talked just earlier about the performance, so you're only losing about 30, 40 performance mm -hmm. on that game for, for so really, that, that's very impressive. So what what um, what have you been able to do with it? What kind of modifications have you been able to do with with Fallout Four to make it work? Actually, actually, let me rephrase the question: What challenges did you have to make Fallout Four work in VR? Oh, you know, with Fallout Four, especially, it has no in, in its shaders. It it has no constant names saved, so we we had to uh, simply. Uh, um, um, read the shader code and read out what actually happens in there to, to find out what the correct matrices are or the correct uh, registers uh, or, or constant buffers to, to modify and that was the, was the hard challenge with that game, yeah? So, okay. I, I, know it's, I know it's a work in progress, okay, because we, you know, actually, well, I mean, it's more than a work in progress. When this video is out, we're releasing the new architecture for Vero Perception. I mean, we're releasing it that people can play it for themselves. You know, congratulations on that. Um, have, are, are gamers going to be able to adjust like the heads-up display and make sure it's viewable in, in the VR device? Excuse me, did not get uh, like when when one of the challenges with Skyrim was we had an interface and we had to resize the interface so that you could see it while you're wearing the heads-up display. Do you, do you remember? Oh, uh, you mean how we will fix the heads-up display? Yeah, yeah. Are we using the same it, technique with Vireo? Yes, sure. Absolutely the same same technique. Yeah. So, so, so people will be able to enjoy the game. They don't have to worry about missing details on the screen and it'll, it'll yes, be good. Yes, yes. The only problem could be uh, that, that uh, shaders are drawn with the same shader as 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 the full screen uh, hat, uh, so we will see 
was it not? Usually it, it, it would work. Well, well, worst case would be that you have to zoom in and zoom out. This would be the worst case. Usually it should work. You know, again, this is not native. So it's amazing that we do what we do and the fact that we have this ability. But even, you know, if we use Skyrim as a, as a comparable, there, you know, it's in part, there are some imperfections there, but it still worked out great. Mm -hmm. so, so now the thing is, Fallout 4, I mean, this is like the flagship game to prove that it works, and obviously we want to build from there. By the way, your mic, you got to point it a little more to your mouth. You tapped on it there. So this is the big... What about other games? And what I mean by that is, you put all this hard work into making Fallout 4 work, but, you know, it's not realistic to have to do that for every single game. Tell us about, I, I maybe it's better you pronounce it, because you came up with the name. I, I think it's called the Kellenist, but I can't pronounce it properly. Tell us about this. What does it do? Why is it so important? Yes, uh, as I told you, uh, two years ago when we finished uh, version 2.1, uh, we more and more looked forward to have, uh, have a new architecture to have a more versatile solution since any time a, a fixed uh, adaptation so-called shader rule for for any game in, in the old architecture I had to re restart the, the whole game to to test this, this this new rule and this new rule we need a, a whole new solution for that so I called it Echelonus. Uh, Echelonus is a, a 3D modification studio that means that besides of your game window in this case you have a second window, uh, a working area where you can uh, work with the game. That means uh, now any thing from Berea is a plug-in, uh, whether it's a tracker, whether it's a stat or this, and and this makes more, 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 much, much more versatile. And especially, you can modify the game when you're inside the game and not not before you start the game. And that that makes much more sense. You can. Eclipse is a is a general tool for modifying DirectX, and you can use it for for any kind of modification, and 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 this will also be out soon, and I will do good tutorials for for people how to use it, and and eventually anyone out there with a little uh, knowledge about how games work should be able to to create uh, to make his his favorite game compatible to to Vireo and to virtual reality. And this is, you know, like I'll give you some real life problems that we face. And I know we haven't solved them yet, but I'm wondering if this could be a potential solution. Like Skyrim, okay? Mm -hmm. Do you remember we had a problem where certain shaders were completely shared? Like like, like the fog and the shadow yeah, were one and yeah, the same? Yeah. Would this have been able to get around that problem? E uh, yes, especially since you can test it always. Uh, uh Live uh, on or, or modify or read out live what happens in, in inside the game. So this this and we will now soon uh, also do DirectX 9 for the new uh, uh, architecture, and then this all should be hopefully fixable. Yeah, it's a it's we we determine as we go. You know, it's not nothing's finalized yet. We're still we're still working on it. But but these are the things that you know Dennis and the team have been working on. So. Um, so that's great. And what about, you know, for, for gamers? Do you think it's going to be complicated for them to create their own profiles with their Kellenist? Like, is it, you know, do you do you have to be like a, a significant coding knowledge, or, or can you pick no, it up pretty quick? No, in this case, yeah, uh, you need to get the basics of DirectX. This this is clear. But eventually, when you know these basics and how on, and, uh, I will try as a, as a as I mentioned. To give good tutorials, no, it shouldn't. It shouldn't be hard, and you should be able to simply uh, load a, the predefined uh, Vireo profile into the game, and and then try to fix them, the, the, find the matrices, and and the hard thing will be maybe Vero Boost, but also here we will at the have a an own Vero Boost scanner node eventually, and and. Yes, this, this should work with, with, an, with if you have a little. It's really exciting stuff because I know people have been waiting a long, long time for this. And it's going to be, it's not going to be pretty. I know it's not going to be like super pretty, like with the interface and the whole thing, you know. But but the fact that this is, you know, you're 
you do this on a volunteer basis, right? I mean, this is everyone who contributes to this. He does it in their own personal time, and I just, I just think it's absolutely amazing. You should feel very proud of this, Dennis. The uh, uh, I'm proud. Yeah. So, I mean, now here, here's another question for you, and using Skyrim as an example, I find that the game behaves a little bit differently on AMD graphics cards versus NVIDIA graphics cards. So, yeah. so in like, would would this software have resolved that as well? Like, do you know? Yes. So that 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 would be a big solution there too. So more compatibility Same. with this. Same. Yeah, the first step after after uh, the now release version four point zero will be to add DirectX nine, and then I will definitely fix this uh, issue for AMD cards. Yes. Okay. Wonderful. So. Um, Next question. So now we're obviously we're building a profile system so people could create their own profiles with very deep access to the games. Mm -hmm. We've got DirectX 11 support, which I think is amazing. Everyone who's seen the you know the videos is impressed with what they see, and this is true stereoscopic 3D. Like this is true left right rendering. Doesn't get no, more 3D. No than fake. That. <laughs> no, no fake technique. No fake technique. No. And you know what I've insisted on? I've driven the developers crazy. I said, no, we're not doing that. <laughs> it's ah. got to be the real stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, so that's great. So then, um, what about asynchronous time warp and like ATW? Uh, and uh, are we are we're going to have those features again, do you think? Yes, sure. We, we will definitely include that. Uh, Oculus should has it now, and and OSVR will hopefully that have that all soon. Uh, yes, yes, sure. We should be able to include that. Yeah. And that's that's another point. Like, which platforms are we are, are we supporting right away? Oh, you mentioned them, but just say it for sure. Yeah. Uh, from startup, we will su fully support Oculus Rift and and OSVR headsets. And we will, of course, support more. You know, it, it, I mean, we have the equipment. That's the only thing is we have the equipment, and we, we work with whoever we have access to, and we want everything to look great. And that's amazing stuff. So with this updated uh, positional tracking. You know, one of, what we used to do with positional tracking is we used to manipulate the matrix. Like we kind of did it inside out, Same. where we would manipulate the matrix to, to do positional tracking. And for those that are unfamiliar with what positional tracking is, is normally like a, a head mount display could have orientational tracking, but positional tracking is when you could actually detect how that head mount is, is uh, relative to your body. Like it's, it's called translation and it's all kinds of elements. But they're often missed if you if you don't do it properly. So games, traditional games, are not designed for positional tracking at all. So that's why we had to do these matrix modifications. Correct me where I'm wrong, Dennis, by the way. Feel free to jump in. So far, so good. You're fine. So far, so so the so now we're using VR Boost to do positional tracking. Can you talk about you know why that's important. Like, what's the advantage of having the game do the work for us? Uh, yes. If you do um, uh, positional tracking by matrix modification, there will seems to click <coughs> someone. If you if you move too far to the right, you maybe see uh, nothing. Since since those objects to the right are usually clipped by the uh, engine of the game. So uh, this is one factor why this should be done by VR Boost uh, and. Yeah, and, and, and all, the whole graphic, the whole game thinks that that if you do it by VR boost, the whole game thinks that you are there if you move to the right. If you do it by matrix modification, the game thinks you are at the at your main position and not to the left or right or up down whatever. So let me, if I could paraphrase and please correct me if I if I miss anything, Dennis. Um, when you do a matrix modification, which basically means the, the game has rendered the whole scene already, okay, so nothing's being changed in the scene, We're, what we used to do is just manipulate the information we had, okay, but from the game's point of view, it doesn't know anything's being manipulated, so it will behave sure. as though nothing's being manipulated. But exactly. what, what we're doing is we're using the game's architecture to actually do the manipulation. 
So when you're positionally tracked in virtual reality, the game knows you're being positionally tracked because we're using exactly. the actual game's source data. So this is so. What do you think the advantages of, of doing that? Like, it, you know, are, are there latency advantages? Like, what you know, why is this important? Uh, no, uh, like there are no latency advantages. <laughs> Uh, latency is the same if you do it by metrics modification or by, or by via boost. Uh, but as I mentioned, uh, things get clipped, clipped or 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 yeah. But this actually ties in why we used it for field of view because you know one of the challenges with games is that they want to save on performance, so they only want to render the amount of data they need because if you render beyond the screen edges, that's wasted. That's wasted processing. Yeah. So what we do is with field of view is we the game increases the field of view. We force the game to increase the field of view. Exactly. So it includes all that extra data. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so with positional tracking, I take it, we're, it's a similar idea where by using the game's architecture, the game knows not to like cut off data or, or it knows to show all the graphics that need to be yeah. shown. And, and what the bad? Excuse me. Yeah, go ahead. Ah, uh, what the bad thing will be uh, with with uh, positional tracking done by by VR boost is that uh, you know now now come the uh, wireless HMDs. Uh, Optoma has a great prototype for this, and uh, eventually with with those uh, you you will be able to move around in, in in the game as as in as in the real world. Yeah. So we're and you've done some preliminary testing with this to make sure yes, to make sure it works. But it's it's very exciting. We're looking forward to doing more experiments in that area as soon as we have the equipment in hand. But it's it's this is really radical stuff. Like this is amazing stuff. Okay, I've been dropping hints on this through the show, but let me be absolutely clear. When we add HTC Vive support, and we will, we're also going to be adding room scale support for the HTC Vive. That means you could take your existing games like Fallout 4, that's a working example, in true stereoscopic 3D, and you're going to have walk around positional tracking with the HTC Vive and any other SDK we support. So it's really exciting stuff, it's the real deal, and uh, this is trend setting stuff. Anyway, back to the interview. I mean, it, it's, it's not gonna be perfect, okay? But it, it's gonna be like, it raises a lot of like positive big questions as to what we could do with these older gaming libraries if there are some titles out there that you know could really be excellent in VR, it's not going to work for everything, I don't think. But but there's probably going to be some flagship titles that lend themselves well to a technology like this. Mm -hmm. So really exciting stuff. So when this video is out, if all goes to plan, so will the first release of this updated VR perception. I don't know how pretty it's going to be. <laughs> I, it will work, but we don't know how pretty it's going to be, like interface and so on. So you're going to have to bear with us. But you're, you're really, I really think everyone, I, I think you'll agree with me, Dennis. I think everyone's going to be really impressed with the potential that comes out of this. Um, well, that's wonderful stuff, Dennis. Anyway, congratulations on all this hey. really exciting stuff. So, so um, did we forget anything? I think. I think we, you're going to share some videos. You've got some videos that you're going to put out of Fallout 4, and you're going to do some regular updates in the in the Vero channel. And uh, I think really people should just download it, try it out, and uh, we'll just make it better. So thank thanks so much for joining us, Dennis. Proud to be there. <laughs> so thanks for joining us. We'll be back right after this. Well, there you have it. So the next release of Vero Perception 4.0, we had hoped it would be at the same time as this this video, um, but I, I've had you know some some travel that I had to do and so on. So we're we're going to get the software out no later than Friday of this week, uh, possibly earlier, but we're you know no later than Friday. Okay, and I think everyone's going to be very happy with it. We just recently got some HTC hardware in. We've already done preliminary testing to make sure that the room scale works. Um, so the HTC support shouldn't be that much longer. We're just getting it out to the uh, developers. But nonetheless, we're really excited. I think everyone is going to be happy with this. It actually has, so far with our preliminary testing, it's, it's performed better than we anticipated. So I think, anyway, I think everyone's going to be really happy about that. Uh, as far as Neil's messy basement is concerned, do you have an opinion to share? Is there something you want to see? I mean, we've got more interviews coming up on the show. 
Um, if you want to visit my messy basement, email neilsmessybasement at mtbs3d.com. Thank you for watching. Thank you for, for uh, doing everything that you do to make MTBS successful and your input and so on with Vireo Perception. We're all really excited about this and we're so grateful that you've been part of it. Anyway, thank you so much for watching. We'll talk again next week. Thank you.